Pasha Paro. Thank you for tuning. The replay. Big boy pep for my peeps. All right, so it's always a perfect day. Yeah, this is video two, but you know, sometimes, um, you know, like I always say, you're so glad things happen like that because two weeks, two months, two years down the road, you know, but at the time you would have never known why it was so significant or what the benefit would be for you in the future. So, um, we had our, we had our, uh, public service announcement earlier in the earlier video and we had a, a comment from life with Chicago. All right. So shout out to Chicago, shout out life with Chicago. He asked, um, he says, I'm down 4k on this one, buddy. And he said, thanks for the vid. And what do you think of CGIX moving forward? So, you know, he's been in for a while and it, it, it took a, it took a nice dive on us. So the good news is, all right. So I told him, I told him basically, let me do a little bit of uh research because I had the initial video that I did where I broke, broke down from that perspective. And I wanted to, when he asked the question, it was boom, perfect day, perfect moment. It kind of, it kind of got me re, uh, energized and I'm grateful for that. So thank you for that. And it made me think because the reason I got into CGIX is because there's an upcoming merger and merger normally means ching, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and then there's some crazy volatility. I don't know if that's the word I said earlier, but that's what it is. It's volatility. <laughs> look, look, came back to me like in the next video, like all oh, late wrong. But anyway, if you watched the video before this one, you'll understand why the volatility just uh, popped out like that. Because I was looking for the word that uh, showcases to you how much the stock moves from its mean or medium whatever you want to say it from the middle point where it normally stay, how much does it actually go back and forth? It's volatility. Anyway, um, the good news is this. When I first did the, uh, the video, because what I was going to say was that after a merger, like a, like a, like a SPAC, um, you know, we made a, we made a nice bit off some SPACs in the last, uh, four to six. What are we doing now? Four? over that have been two I guess we're really talking four months here with you guys we've been doing it so um we we've made some nice uh detail off some specs uh so special acquisition mergers so um what we what we see is when they or just like an IPO when they first come out um it's a lot of volatility sometimes so here's the news right here's here's because I wanted to look into the merger some more to get some more detail before I address your question. I'm not one of people like that just randomly blurt out stuff. When you ask that and seeing the significance of your, 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 your position, I definitely wanted to make sure I gave you um, a thorough, a thorough answer in a short period of time to help you out. And I appreciate the exercise. This is exercise for me. Okay. So, so basically when you watch the other video I did on it, I got in, it shot. I got in here, right? Here's where I got in. And after hours and then not paying attention because that's the period of time I'm in right now where I, I don't have time to pay attention to them. Like, uh, like a swing trade or anything like that. But so I'm in, I'm in it for the long on these picks. So it went up from $7 to $17 at the opening of the next day, which that'd have been a nice, that'd have been a nice selling point if we knew <laughs> what was going to happen, but we didn't. So when it came back down, you know, after, after hours, I uh, observed it. And I bought back in here 
and I created all this. The green box was my original from the time I went in. And then this box right here was my original uh, box. Sketchy zone up here. Buy-in zone here. Now, that was here on this day. So this day, or this, you know, it's the next day when I bought back in some more. Not to say back in, but I bought some more. I increased my position here. Um, and I created the rest of these outlines, if I want to call it such, uh, maps for me to, to understand. So at that point in time, this yellow box down here, I said was the slippage zone. And I said, it should be, com it should stay above this, but if it drops below this, it could slide to 587. And, but this whole green box is a comfortable, you know, buy-in based off of this crazy spike. So since then, as you can see, it's been holding this line for better or for worse, because the next stop below this, if it, if it drops 583 easy. Okay. So pay attention to that element of it. Now, the weird thing is this, right? If we look at some of the news, and I got I got some detail for you. Stay with me. It won't be a super long video like I, you know, but I got, I got some information for you to consider. And I'm just starting here. So give me a few moments. I appreciate your time. Uh, if you haven't already, subscribe, like, comment, share. And if you comment, your comments might get shared on the channel. So... Now, on the 10th, right? On the 10th, we know what we know about this on the 1st. Now, on the 10th, they came out with this and they said, "Hey, uh Brief Cancer announces Genetics announces 17.5 million common share stock offering priced at the market." But right? So, the purchase price was $6.30 a share. And then they issued, we get around, let's say 2.75 million shares, right? Now, the interesting thing is this was the 10th. So on the 10th is the same day we went from 17, basically down to 650. And what, what I find is, My observation is if a stock is above the offering price, I haven't seen too many offerings that come out as, as above. I mean, the uh, the offering itself is above the, the stock price current. It tends to drift towards that, that price, right? So something happened here. But I don't have detail of what what actually happened. You know what I mean? Because this came out at let's say twenty three oh one, twenty three oh two, so that would be eleven o'clock. Right? So that shouldn't have affected this, but this drop could have been from maybe anticipation that this was coming because it headed that direction. But then the question is what caused it to go up to begin with, right? All right, now that in the grand scheme of what I'm gonna talk about is kind of irrelevant, but I just wanted to put that thought out there, okay? Because this stock definitely raced back down towards the 630, right? All right, and remember this number, 17.5 million, okay? Now, if we go look at this, their market cap is $26 million. All right? Their whole float is $2.8 million. So basically, when... When you see 
when I see, and I'm no expert, right? This is just what I'm observing. So they issued 2.7 thousand shares. 2.7 million, excuse me. Let's say 2.8. But the whole float is only 2.8. So what I'm trying to say is like, the float is, how, how do I describe it properly? Um, the float is like, if your company puts out a hundred shares, that's it. There's only a hundred shares, but a, a, a thousand people want to buy it, right? They can still buy it. So your float is going to be 900 because you got a hundred and then 900 more shares were sold to make your thousand people have stock. So you have a float of 900. I'm pretty sure that's like the simple explanation of it. Um, so what I'm looking at here is to say, okay, y'all, y'all put out 2.8 million shares basically, right? And your float is 2.8 million. So that's almost like a one for one, right? So basically the shares that they just put out, despite they have, they had a, a offering prior to this of 5.0 million shares. They, they're per this data, their float is basically this lat is equal to this last offering. Now there may be some more, more precise, more technical data somewhere, but just going off of this, right? So that's almost a one for one. So with that being said, I would really expect that sick that dollar amount to be significant of the price offering, more so than a stock where they have already. Uh, 100 million shares as the float and then they offer 10 million shares you see what I'm saying it's going to dilute a little bit but they got so much in volume how much of an impact would that make right so I'm thinking there might have been something that maybe either obviously I missed because I didn't spend hours looking for it but something happened here that caused this to go up that wasn't an accident whether it was, you know, it could have been a, even if it was a Reddit post, I don't know. But something caused this to go up. But then knowledge of this, I think, is what grabbed it back down. Now, here, let's get into this. Because what's going on is this is the merger with this company, Stemonics. All right? And you can see here from August, it's a, it's a micro-organ startup. Right? Now, if we look at this article here from Biospace, it says Cancer Genetics and, and Stemonics announce joint proof of concept. So that that changed the way I was looking at this for a moment because which it's not I'm gonna get to it. So it's not actually CGIX. They're they're it, they're part of the merger by default because they're actually the parent company of the company merging. So there's still I'll get to it. There's still a huge opportunity here, but let's check it out. So this company, right? These two were working like together. So a leader of drug discovery and preclinical oncology, and Immuno Oncology Services and Stimex, right? So CGIX, but it's saying CGIX, but we're going to get to this company here, which is actually who they're merging with, Viofarm, and then their parent company is Cancer Genetics, Inc., all right? So a company empowering the discovery of new medicines through the convergence of novel human biology and software technologies today announced joint proof of concept program. So here it goes. Stemonics and Viofarm, registered trademark, a subsidiary of Cancer Genetics, recently launched a joint proof of concept program to assess CNS, central nervous system, 
safety, and toxicity of novel compounds. Hence, ads on the page with... <laughs> Never mind. So the companies believe that combining capabilities and technologies from each team will save time, drive cost efficiency, and de-risk decisions, thereby establishing higher confidence in drug development success. The parties anticipate that the alliance will demonstrate the expertise of each company and be a first step for continuing to push forward and developing cutting edge drug discovery efforts. Now, all of this right here, capabilities, uh, combining capabilities and technology, save time, drive cost efficiency, de-risk decisions, higher confidence. You could basically translate that into their customer relations and in the development of, of drug success. This is all really good because it's basically showing that together they're going to become a more lean company and uh, meaning like they're going to be more profitable, basically. They're going to be able to be more robust, more flexible, more agile, and deliver better quality by coming together, right? Which is always good for the bottom line and for the dollar uh, and for the customers and the stockholders. Now... When you look at, um, all right, so here, look, let's read this line real quick. Our, our goal in conjunction with Stimonex is to create and offer the best in class and most innovative drug discovery solutions to our customers, right? All right, so when you look at Biofarm or VivoFarm, like I said, they are, a subsidiary or cancer genetics actually owns them and all all of this detail is building up to why i'm gonna save you i'm gonna save you some time i think it's good but it it's a matter of how soon do you want it uh, uh you know what i mean i'm not promising 17 dollars tomorrow although we didn't know that was going to happen when we got in the day before either but hear me out there's something i need you to see so all right, so if we go to their website, right, we get this line here, proprietary uh, preclinical oncology. So I looked that up just to just to see what was what. They pop up some other stuff. So let's see here. Um, let's let's give this guy three minutes for what it's worth. It if you listen to what he's saying more so than what you're seeing, I think that'll be key. And we'll come back, and I'll tie some more things together, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up, and I'll show you what all this adds up to and in a moment. I'm co-founder of Vivo Farm, located in my office at the Hershey Center of Applied Research. Yeah, let me give it a full start. Hello. I'm Dr. Ralf Brandt, co-founder of Vivo Farm, located in my office at the Hershey Center of Applied Research in Pennsylvania. Over the years, I have acquired an extensive knowledge in drug discovery and development gathered from my assignments at the National Cancer Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, the Sharing AG in Berlin, the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas, and at the Novartis Pharma AG in Basel, Switzerland. Vivo Farm was founded in 2003 in Australia to serve the drug development community worldwide with a focus on research and support services for the development of novel anti-cancer drugs. Do you want to see more? Let's go. And Follow you know, me. cancer is like a huge focus business anyway. From day one, to serve the biopharma industry with an industrial-like approach, help distinguishing us from the lower service quality of our competitors. We are known for excellent communication, keeping timelines, reasonable pricing, and delivering on our. And and I'm gonna stop it here for a second. And the reason I say pay attention to what he say more so than what you see is because when I was looking at this, I saw a small company, right? And you're gonna you're gonna see the same thing. Like when you think of big biopharma, you 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 know which comes to your mind. And when you see this, don't worry about what you're seeing. Because I'm going to tell you why in a moment. 
but listen to what he's saying. And I'll make it all make sense. We are known for excellent communication, keeping timelines, reasonable pricing, and delivering on our promises. Those are value propositions which over the years has afforded us a loyal customer base with many repeat clients. Within one year from 2003, Vivo Farm served customers in Australia and expanding to serve pharma and biotech firms in Europe and the United States, resulting in a doubling of our revenues each year for the first four years. Vivo Farm now has a presence in... Doubling of their revenue each year for the first four years. Three continents with operations in Hershey, Pennsylvania, Munich, Germany, and Melbourne and Adelaide in Australia, with a strong customer base in the United States, Europe, and the Asia-Pacific area, and is experiencing rapid growth from these regions worldwide. Our services expand to predictive tumor models such as autotopic, syngenetic, and metastasis models, angiogenesis and cachexia models, and we are open to take on board specialized models from our clients and establish a whole bunch of models that I can't pronounce and we would have to use some Google research to find out exactly what it is, but it's all related to making drugs and testing stuff. Complex custom systems for them, including supporting new biomarkers for them. Clients and establish complex custom systems for them, including supporting new biomarker development. Vivo Farm is GLP compliant, with our operations in Australia providing toxicological, histological, and clinical services as well as providing high-quality bioanalytical services for small molecules and biomolecules. We help small emerging companies in their program development to generate meaningful decisions driving compound flowcharts and... Okay, so that line right there, right? They help small companies develop. All right? And I'm going to get to why this is important. We help small emerging companies in their program development to generate meaningful decisions driving compound flowcharts and streamlining their success in drug discovery and development. We provide strong capabilities for new model and service developments, which are well supported by the Australian Tax Concession Grant Program, which we also make available to our customers from everywhere in the world. We are back in my office, and I hope that you enjoyed the tour. As we leverage our state-of-the-art facilities and proceed into the future of our strategic plans, we intend to expand our suite of novel solutions to augment traditional drug discovery and development processes and continue to be an attractive partner for large pharma and smaller biotechs to advance their products to commercialization. I hope to see you soon. So, see, when we were talking about on, um, what stock was it? Well, the one that had, like, the four, there was, you know, the stages of, of, of going to commercial. You got the preclinicals, phase one, phase two, phase three. Um, then it can get approved. Then it can go commercial. So this company helps other other companies go through that process with their services, right? And then they probably got some things here, as you can see that they've discovered as well and and they they do an eight thing with right so global integrated discovery services unique uh leading capabilities in that and here we go so they're gonna put the client first they got a knowledgeable team they have innovative research and there some things here that we can we can look into in more detail and get some more information on now here's why those key things in the video i wanted to to pay attention to because when we go back to when we go back to this right um so what we know is the process of discovering and developing a new drug candidate takes years and comes with a price tag of hundreds of millions of dollars or even billions of dollars so these companies that they're helping are basically paying them to do this for them, but it saves them a lot more money than that because they don't have to have that staff. And I and I and I know we saw, you know, when you think of a large company like Johnson and Johnson or AstraZeneca, or you, you're thinking about laboratories and stuff, you know, you see this, you may feel, 
you know, it may feel less than, right? But these you, you can make a lot with a little, you know, especially in certain arenas because you're just running a test, you're running a trial, and you're, and you're giving proofs, and you're doing the reports. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, when I first saw it, I was like, oh, they're kind of small. But it makes sense, and I'm almost to why it all makes sense, okay? So, you know this is going to be a lot of opportunity for them, and they're growing, right? This is this is speaking about um, cancer, and basically they, when they sign their agreements to merge. So, this is what we were looking at. Now, we get into this, and we get here, right? So, who's their competition as far as CGI? So when we go and look at that, we see this. Now, Aller, I don't know how you feel about them. This is actually the first time I've seen them, but just in doing some quick research, I kind of like what I found here in order to give you uh, this information to tie it all together. <laughs> so what I want to do is, first of all, we know their annual revenue is $6.3 million. And the thing I don't like about this is I ain't gonna say I don't like about it because I probably just haven't spent enough time with it or I'm overlooking it but I don't know what the date of this data actually is they tell you when it was founded but um, I don't know as of what date this data was was recorded or is accurate okay so but based on when this this was um, they have an annual revenue of six point three million and one hundred and fifty employees. Okay, so here's what I want to look at. So here they are as a whole. Now, six point three million. Their funding was sixty million dollars at this time, and I mean this this CEO rating is <laughs> who rated them. Uh, do you trust their rating? You know, all that comes into play, whatever you want to do there. So I, I'm not worried about that part. What I'm looking at is these last three columns here. Because whenever they did this, at least all these numbers were the same. So we can compare, we can compare them based off of at the time of publication. Okay. So what I'm seeing here, if you can see here, funding sixty million, they had a revenue of uh, six point three. This one didn't disclose, but they were their their revenue was five hundred million. This one had a revenue a funding of one sixty one, hundred sixty one million. They made almost a billion dollars. This one had a funding of three hundred five million. They're at three. They're over three billion dollars. Forty one million. They made ten million. Right. Um, Ninety million. Okay, so you see where I'm going with this, right? Twenty-two million, they made four point one billion. All right. So, and then this one's pretty small. They only had twelve employees, and they had fifty million, and their revenue is less than a million dollars. So this is the anomaly. If I was to have more time, I would probably go look at them and see what they're not, what they are or aren't doing, because. With 12 employees, they may be one of them companies that's like on their way out and they're just hanging on to uh, some things they created like um, Mac Pharmaceuticals and they're just waiting for that payout. It's kind of like a similar figure to that. But um, so I would want to look and see why they're in that position before I actually give them any weight with the rest of them. So we got 70, 777 million here and they're bringing in 271 million in revenue. However, here's the key of all that. Despite the money numbers, whether it was funding or revenue, what I'm seeing is a correlation between the number of employees and the actual amount of revenue. And then this would fit even without doing research. 12, they're under a million. 135 employees, they're doing 28 million. These these guys had four, uh, 454, they're doing 271. These guys have 61,000 employees. They're doing 4.1 billion, right? I'm getting to it. I think you already see where I'm going with it. So 145 employees, 3.7 million. 829 employees, 441 million. 
87 employees only. Now you're back down to 10 million. Okay, 16,000, they're doing 3 billion. They're a little bit more efficient than the one with 63 or 61,000, but they're still in the billions. 2,900 employees, they're almost at a billion. 1,200 employees, half a billion. Now I'll come back to these guys, CGIX, 150 employees, and they're at 6.3 million. So, what my consensus is, just based off another short burst of research on top of my last video, is they're in a good position and this, and this merger is going to be a step in the right direction for them. Um, I think that's going to definitely increase their revenue and their value because if nothing else, they're going to be increasing capacity and employees. And apparently what's this, these companies have in common is the more employees they have, the more revenue they can generate. They're pretty much, it looks like, only limited by the negotiations of their business, right? But how many employees they have so that they can produce. You see what I'm saying? And if we go to acquisitions here, we find that in 14, there was some acquisition, but it went, it's it's un, unlisted here. Or maybe it, because there's an amount, so there's something happened here. And then um, in 2015, they acquired Response Genetics, right? For 14 million. Then they acquired in 2017 Bevo Farm. Remember, they said they help small companies and they're looking to make partnerships. So, probably what's going on is these companies were paying them to do the service, do the business, and then they wind up saying, hey, how about we just merge together so what i'm seeing here is they have a history of growth and although they're they're in a position there now after that crazy spike and without speaking about what i think is in the long term they're going to continue to grow and you see what the competition is making. 500 million, a billion, three billion. Out of what? One, two, three, four, ten competitors, right? It said ten? Yeah, ten. Out of ten, we know that three, one, two, three. So 30% of their competition is doing billions of dollars in, in, in a year. One of, them, one of them's doing half a billion. So we could say we could say forty percent of the competition is doing more than half a billion dollars a year. And they're currently at six point three million. So that that Vivo Farm that we just looked at, they just picked them up, you could say three years ago. You know what I mean? So they're when you go through a when you go through a merger like three years is, is it's really no time, depending on how, how how big something is and how big how well established the other company is. Because then you gotta get in, merge, change, every, adapt to each other, change this part of the system, do that. Oh, you using that software? We need to get you on this software. That could take two years by itself. So these company, this one that's just merged with them is really just probably starting to just now get the benefits and the effects of that merger that they did in 2017. So now they're ready to buy this next company, which will go here in the list, right? And the process will repeat itself. Now all of these companies will be able to work together as one, combined with everything else they got going on, any other subsidiaries. So they're, they're stacking their Legos right now, and they're building their castle. So it depends on how long you got that you want to hang in there, but I think in the in the future, and I can't tell you exactly when because this is not one of them things where uh, it's not one of them things. You know what I'm saying? But people that know, um, 
I think even more than I do are going to see value in this. And there should be a move when the merger happens in the upward direction, I think. And then it'd be a matter of how the volatility affects it after the news breaks of this of the merger. As long as they actually the, the shareholders are vote on it and they merge, if that's even on the table as an option um, for it to not go through or something. But I think as we get closer to that, it should start to get some traction. It'll be some more attention. It should climb. There'll probably be some volatility, and then super, and then longer term beyond that into the unknown quotable time period. This is as long as they continue this model of hey, we're 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 making money off of you. You might as well just join us. They're going to continue to grow, and then there'll be one of these forces on here that's making you know probably billions of dollars or at least a half billion dollars sometime in in the foreseeable future because they have a great model. If you're picking up a company here, a company there. They're averaging what a company every two years, basically. What twenty nineteen would have been the the next two year period. So they're they're technically we're just into twenty twenty one. COVID happened, messed up twenty twenty. Uh, so they they could have had this on the table. This was slated or announced in August of twenty twenty. So technically, you see what I'm saying? They're they're right on schedule. They're averaging like a new company every two to three years. And as if they started to increase their growth, then that'd be happening even faster. Or if they just expand, that's gonna, you know what I mean? So they're gonna they're gonna continue to grow basically. But I'm not one of them people to just come on here and say, they're gonna continue to grow. Watch my video, subscribe. Okay, we're out of here in five minutes. Go live your life. I, I wanted you to make sure you you know, I, those people and they're talking off you know, I, you know, I wanted to give you substance. So when I tell you they're gonna grow, it's just a matter of do we have the patience to wait it all the way out? You know? Um, but this is definitely, they're going in the right direction. They got a good game plan. So, Pasha Paro, YN7, thank you for tuning. The replay.